In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. So one of the things that when I look back at the first big monumental shift where I saw Blockstream and, and many others, I'm not just saying it's Blockstream, many others kind of came to the table was the 2017 fork. People that I find this fascinating on Twitter, I think very few people, especially the, the people that have just come into the space in the last two years, I don't think they understand any of this background from the 2017 fork. So for the people that have been in the space for a while, this might be a little slow pace for us to talk about this, but I think it's really important for people that aren't familiar with what we're talking about for you to give a little bit of a history on it. And then we can get into the nuances of the engineering behind what's taking place since that and how exciting some of this stuff is. So explain to them what happened in 2017. And I mean, get into all the nitty gritty detail. All right. So I guess that episode of Bitcoin's history, it goes by a few names. There's the scaling debate, the fork wars, the Bitcoin civil war. I mean, which one, which one do you think is a, a more suitable? All of them, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was a very interesting time. And I think it culminated in 2017 or maybe, yeah, I think culminated in 2017, but it started. The genesis was in probably even earlier. So Pete Rizzo and uh, Aaron Van Wordham recently released a post about uh, P2SH and that little mini war. That, I think that was uh, the beginning of the, the schism where Gavin Andreessen and other developers started beginning this little conflict. And I think it heated up when um, Mike Hearn and Gavin tried to push Bitcoin XT as an upgrade. And that was probably mid to late 2015. And the idea behind that, I think, is largely them trying to get rid of the other developers based on disagreements and not seeing eye to eye. And Gavin's off, often presented as a, you know, a very good developer, but that I don't believe is actually the case. And that is a source of that friction between him and the other developers. So the beginning of this, the genesis is really an effort to fork off Bitcoin and tell everyone that uh, we're upgrading. So I forgot if it was Gavin or Mike. One of them contacted me back then. Uh, I was the CEO of BTC China or BTCC, which was one of the largest exchanges in mining pools. And they were contacting me because they said, we're upgrading now. It's time for you to upgrade to Bitcoin XT. And you know this is supported by all the developers. And at the time, the channels of communication, people being accessible and making their opinions heard, it was very, very different from what you see today. You know, Everyone is vocal. They're on Twitter. Adam is out there. He's got 200,000 so on followers. But back then, like, there was no Bitcoin Twitter or even crypto Twitter. Discussions for Bitcoin development were largely on the mailing list and in IRC. And I think the general populace just had a very poor understanding of um, everything that was going on. And it opened the door for them to try to throw this upgrade up there or quote unquote upgrade and say, you know, this is it. And this and, upgrade that you're referring to was all about being able to do more transactions, right? Per block. That's what this whole thing yes. was about. Everyone was looking at it and they're saying, well, how is this thing going to scale? Because and I might get this number wrong. What's the number that Bitcoin can do per second? Seven to 10. Seven it's to 10. And then when error. you look at Visa and MasterCard, it's like tens of thousands, like 20 or 30,000. Is that correct? Yeah. Something like that. Upwards of tens of thousands, twenties of thousands. So people were looking at this and saying, all right, well, this clearly isn't going to work long term because it can't scale for the number of transactions that are going to be needed if this tries to take on a, a global presence. All the engineers that have been involved to date were like, how do we solve this? And so Gavin, who you were talking about, was coming with what did you say the upgrade that he was calling it? Bitcoin XT. Bitcoin XT. So you're working in a mining pool and you're saying, what in the world is this? Yeah. And um, well, there's two ways you can look at that. The optimistic way is that these guys wanted to scale Bitcoin and uh, they're coming out with the best of intentions that they want uh, higher TPS and they want to scale it to the point where a billion people could use Bitcoin on-chain transactions for pennies on the dollar. And then the uh, more nuanced approach is it was a power play because of this struggle with the other developers because of disagreements and possibly their lack of ability. And then the even more darker way is this was the first attempt to co-op Bitcoin, to centralize it, to um, basically hard fork it and exert control over it at the protocol level. Um, because once you do that, then there is really no going back. You've set yourselves down this path where you can upgrade it at any time. And then you kind of become like Ethereum, which is, you know, willy nilly upgrades. Anybody can change a number and it's largely meaningless. There, there is no immutability. And just for, for the non-technical folks that are listening to this, 
when you try to put that many transactions into one block, the problem that pops out of this is it requires a huge amount of, of hard drive space for anybody running a full node. Because you have such a, a massive amount of hard drive space required to run a full node, you're pretty much pushing into servers and only a few people can run the servers and it becomes centralized. And then those few people that are running the servers basically control any and all updates that happen in the future. So there's this trade-off that Samson's getting that he's describing here, where if you keep the block small so that anybody and everybody can run a full node, the whole protocol continues to be decentralized and no one can take it over. But the problem with doing that is you keep these small transaction size, five or six transactions per second, which clearly doesn't work long term. So talk to us about how the solution that ultimately took place, how did that, all that unravel? It's a very long story. Like There were several different upgrades that came out, quote unquote upgrades that came out and there were sides, lines were drawn in the sand of who was a big blocker and small blocker. So there's this division of people that wanted the block small, because as you were saying, it is important. And I think even today, I don't think people fully understand the importance of why you want anybody to be able to sync up a full node. Because once you become a centralized service, there you can't really decentralize yourself, right? If every Bitcoin node is in a server farm, well, that's really no different than the legacy financial system where you trust the bank. You know, you ask the bank, how much money do I have? The bank tells you, you've got a thousand bucks. That's it. End of discussion. Whether it's right or wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whether it's right or wrong. This was like an ongoing conflict. And you know, once Bitcoin XT failed to get traction, another one came out, uh, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited, and then Segwit 2X. But all of these were efforts to um, change the block size and change the protocol and change things that were already set. A common theme during this era was the Bitcoin developers and, and Blockstream by extension because Blockstream often gets conflated in all of these arguments with Bitcoin development, because there were a lot of developers, Bitcoin core developers at Blockstream. But the argument was like, you guys don't want to compromise. But it wasn't really the point. Like that was never the case. You can't really say the developers don't want to compromise because as we learned at the end, at the culmination of the, the scaling civil war, it's the users that matter. So this was kind of a, a false argument saying those guys, those developers, they want to control the protocol. They don't want to increase the size. They don't care about uh, people living in third world countries being able to transact for free. It's all their fault. But at the end, we saw we had well, lots of companies band together into this big alliance, Coinbase, BitGo, a number of uh, companies under DCG, and they formed this coalition that was pushing Segwit2x. I just want to provide my point of view from, from 2017, because the argument that people didn't want the transactions to be able to occur for all the unbanked, really kind of the Roger Ver argument, right? That's a strong argument, but what I think it fails to do, it's putting the priorities out of whack. Like They, they had their priorities not in the correct order. And from my vantage point, the number one thing, the number one priority is having a fixed number of units inside the protocol that cannot be manipulated and it has to be decentralized, right? Like that is priority number one, because if you don't do that vital thing, you're not fixing the problem because the problem yep. is that we don't, we don't have a peg for any currency in the world right now. And so we have to get that perfect. We cannot even have a blemish on that particular mission. And then anything else that we can do on top of that as a second tier spinoff, right? As far as transactions to the unbanked and all that kind of stuff, like that's the icing on the cake. As far as I'm concerned, and it seems like the market agreed and, and went in that direction. But you know, a lot of people listening to this might say, well, I don't understand why one thing was more important than the other, but I can see by the way you're nodding your head, you completely agree. It seems like everybody else there, Blockstream agreed, right? It's about the evolution of money. I think it's commonly accepted. Nick Zabo has written a lot of papers about this. Money is first evolved as a, a collectible, then it becomes a store of value. Then you have the uh, medium of exchange phase and then unit of account. And I think you're mentioning Roger Ver, like he's argued very publicly that it needs to be the medium of exchange first and the store of value second. A common sense dictates that that's not the case. Like you could use anything as a medium of exchange, but it won't necessarily be a store of value. And as an example, you can look at the hyperinflating currencies of some failing countries, right? Like the, the Venezuelan Bolivar, like that's a great medium of exchange. Everyone in the country uses it, but it's not a store of value and you can't go backwards. When I was coming to Bitcoin, I was coming to Bitcoin because I was coming out of this finance background. I was looking at what was happening in the bond market. And I was looking at this 80 year treasury curve and saying, this is a disaster. Like, this is being completely manipulated 
and we're going to zero. And then after it goes to zero, people are going to be taking cash out of their bank account and putting it in into underneath of their bed because that's going to give them a better return than a negative interest rate. And so when I was looking at it from that lens, from the finance lens, I was like, we've got to fix the money, not the we don't have issues with going to Starbucks and paying. Like that's not the the fundamental issue here. The fundamental issue is we've got this race to debase. And man, what a what an important step for Bitcoin at this particular point in time back in 2017. Having not known anything that uh, the research that I know now versus back in 2017, I was very concerned with this fork. And once I learned, <laughs> this is going to sound really basic for a guy like you, but when I learned that when the fork was going to occur, that I was going to get both coins, it was kind of like, okay, well, there's no risk here. Like, I'm just going to let the market decide which one is right. And then it's not really kind of a risk to me. And I think that's a really important point for people coming into the space for the first time. They might hear, like, oh my God, they can fork the code. Well, what does that mean? And, and, but you get both coins in the fork and then you just let the market decide on which one is going to, win, right? And we all know which one won. But anyway, I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. I want you to keep describing this because this is so important for people that are coming into the space right now to fully understand how we got here. So I think the crux of that whole thing was, can somebody come in and change the code? Can companies band together and dictate a change? Because when Armstrong was leading this charge, Brian Armstrong of Coinbase, he was basically saying, this is an upgrade and we companies have decided. And there was a lot of power behind that. Like they had the mining pools too. Jihan Wu from Bitmain was backing this heavily. Coinbase was a huge player at that time. Blockchain.com.info, those guys as well. But this was a, a question like who controls Bitcoin? Who dictates the future of Bitcoin and where it goes? And that question was answered. It's the users, ultimately. It's the, the full node the, operators. Exactly. Even the people that use it, like just transacting and holding Bitcoin. Even if you're not a full node, you still decide because you are that economic might that gives it value. So similar to how some miners misunderstood originally. So during the first halving, when Bitcoin supplies have, some of the miners said, nah, we like 50 Bitcoins per block reward. We're not going to go with 25. And they, they ran a different fork and nobody cared because with the old, <laughs> we don't recognize your change to the protocol to give yourself more rewards. It is predetermined and that is the path forward. But this is a very slippery slope. If you can change the block size for reasons, no matter how good your reasons are, then you can change the supply of Bitcoin from 21 to 42 or whatever you like. And there's always a good reason to do something. There's always a palatable reason for the masses. Like there are not enough Bitcoin for everyone in the world to have one full Bitcoin. And that kind of argument will resonate with a lot of the populace because it sounds nice. When someone's offering you something for free, it's not always a, a good thing. There's always some cost involved. And I don't believe it during this period, this time period of Bitcoin's history, that everyone understood that dynamic or those trade offs. But, you know, it's very difficult to understand. Like, I was actually a big blocker at first. So uh, there's an article in Bitcoin Magazine where I opined about it and I said, you know, we should increase the block size. It's not a good idea for the fee market to price people out at this time. And that was before I really understood it. <laughs> and I had a long chat with Adam for a good couple hours and he explained a lot of it to me. But the workings of Bitcoin are just counterintuitive. Like there's nothing like it. Nothing has existed like Bitcoin in history before Bitcoin. And it just takes a lot of time to wrap your head around those mechanics of why it works this way and why things are important. Like, why do I need to run a node? It doesn't make any sense at first, but when you really dive in and, and figure it out, then it makes perfect sense. For people that are our traditional investors that listen to the show, they understand corporate governance and they understand voting rights. And the easiest way that I would describe running a full node, it's like having a voting right to which protocol wins and which one you're going to. So if, if we have a bunch of miners from China that say, we don't like this protocol, we're going to upgrade the software and we're going to try to do this. Everyone who's running a full node is saying, well, you can do that, but this is the one that we're, we're saying and we're voting for that everyone's using. And if they want to mine on a version of software that's not compatible with what all the full node operators are saying is, is Bitcoin, well, they're just wasting their, their time, their energy, and their money. So I want to hear your opinion on... I hear a lot this idea that mining in China is centralized, and this poses a threat to Bitcoin. I want to hear your response to that based on what we were just talking about. Yeah, so... So back then, <laughs> during the fork wars, it was a scary time. Like there were all these mining pools saying, "We're going to do something. We're going to upgrade to uh, Segwit 2x." Right? Like 
the thing that people don't understand about mining is the pool operators are communicating, but the individual miners are still like regular people. They could be a small operation, they could be a big operation, but they don't have that same voice. So it's the pool operators in some sense taking advantage of the hash rate they have under their command, which is not their hash rate for the most part. Like some pools might own their own miners, but for large part, they're just providing a service to their customers. And during that time, they were actually misrepresenting a lot of the intent. So being in China and knowing a lot of the individual miners, that was not the case. Like they didn't want this thing. This was just somehow politicized. Like Bitmain and Jihan just got it into their heads that we want big blocks. And he didn't really ask his uh, customers, do you want this too? But he made a lot of bold statements at the time. So that is one common misunderstanding of how mining works. The pools are often can represent views of their own, but say we have all this hash rate supporting it. I think slush was an interesting one. They actually let their miners vote and say what they wanted. I think that's an interesting way to go about it. But uh, the big thing about mining is like, well, first of all, mining is not as China centric as people will make it out to be these days. I think some numbers have been thrown out there, like 65% of the hash rate is in China. I think it's lower than that. I think it's probably down to like 50% now, just because there's been a great deal of expansion out into North America, uh, Russia, and just you know all over the globe. Blockstream has contributed to some of that too, when we started our mining op. But it ultimately doesn't matter. The miners are providing a service. They get paid through block rewards and the, the fee reward to extend the blockchain. And that's it. End of story. So if the users say no, then the miners can only say, well, OK, then I will follow my beliefs and I just won't get paid. And that, that's fine. That's free market behavior. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.